Fresh cut foxing, Roy's making hay before the partridges arrive, while taking care to avoid the frogs. Plus wild meat wedding, Kai puts on a show of game and gets a butcher's perspective. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Old beasts, aren't they? Before yeah, so marshland foxing, they? where marshland oh, frogging. This marsh frog is Europe's largest native species of frog and was introduced to Kent in the 1930s. The marsh frog chorus will be performing the backing track to this evening's main activity, which is to dial down the predator numbers before the game birds arrive. So I've managed to sneak out for a couple of hours because I just can't resist this time of year. Um, we've had the, uh, the hay cut out on the marsh here and we've got the partridges coming in um, within about the next 10 days so we've really got to get a little bit of a headway into uh, reducing the fox population out here before they start causing problems because as soon as the partridges come out here, um, especially the, the young foxes, they just absolutely hammer them and we'll be constantly badgering the partridges in the release pens. Um, the fields were cut two or three days ago um, and they've already started bathing some of them. Unfortunately, we couldn't get out any earlier because we've had a full moon. So this is about the first night that um, we could get out here, that we're not going to be illuminated by the moon behind us, um, which again is just not good, especially you know, when, you, when you start out, you don't want to be educating a piece of ground that's got lots of foxes on it. Um, and when you're hopefully going to be shooting big numbers, the last thing you want to be doing is, uh, is riding around with a full moon and uh, announcing our presence all over the place. One Before we hit the cut grass fields, meter. Roy needs to check zero. He's been given a Mauser M18 with Minoxcope and a front-mounted Pulsar night vision unit to test. But he needs to be satisfied that all are in tune. So what we're going to do is we're going to shoot with the lamp to start with, just to make sure that we're on target and see where we're going. And then once I've got the rifle zeroed and I'm happy with it, then we're going to transfer over to the night vision. And hopefully we should be shooting in exactly the same spot. So. Let's see what this little old Mauser can do. Okay. With three shots, we are smack on target. So theoretically, we should just be able to click on the front mounted night vision. We've got a, a housing here that just locks down in position like that with a shim underneath. So that's nice and tight and firm on there. The only thing, obviously, you just need to make sure is you've got enough clearance um, with the mounts underneath so it's not interfering with your barrel, which this has. And then it should just be a case of locate that on, lock it into position, and we shall turn it on and see what we get. Okay, so we have got pretty much where we need to be on there. So we shall load up and see if we can find some foxes. With the kit singing in harmony, Roy hits the harmonica call. Nothing. Not a sausage. He swaps to the willow call and possibly discovers a bit of old sausage. You can tell the calls have been sitting in my pockets for a little while. I don't know what was in there. <laughs> This is not going to plan. Maybe all that sliced and diced food left over from the mowing has already been snapped up by the scavengers. It means that Roy is going to have to work harder than normal. From the sea wall, our eagle-eyed eagle falconer spots a flash of eyes. We have to drive closer to be sure it's foxy. It is, and there are three of them. He 
he's still coming forward, yeah? Yeah, I've got you on that one. Where's the others? We had three cubs um, and they all started to come to the corn then. We just then had to creep forward because as they were coming forward they were going in the long grass and where they were was absolutely perfect um, because we could we could just see them through there. If they came any further forward then we would have lost them um, in this particular patch. So we just crept forward, just did a few little hand squeaks um, and got their interest and that was it. So we managed to come for all three which is absolutely spot on. I mean, that's what we try and do. And again, that's the lovely thing with night vision because you can just put it on it. They don't know what's going on. There's just a few bangs and then you can account for the litter pretty quickly like that. So we didn't educate any, all three down. Um, and uh, again, absolutely perfect because within, we're within about 200 yards of where the partridge, one of the partridge pens is here. So they would have really caused us problems that little litter. I think the problem is where we are a few days later than um, when they've cut. I think they've probably been out on the, the, the cut fields, they've been in there, they've uh, eaten pretty much everything that's been cut up um, when the hay's been made um, and now they've, uh, they're all venturing back into the long grass and starting to hunt again. Um, but again we just couldn't get out when the, uh, the grass was cut because we had full moons. So this is about as good or as close as we could do it because we've got a nice dark night tonight but um, as I say not a bad start um, we're cracking onto the evening now at least it's cooling down a little bit when we started out it was still roasting hot uh, we've got a, a nice cool breeze coming in off the sea now um, so it's, uh, it's taken the, the sting out of the heat a little bit but hopefully we can find a few more <laughs> you need to bulk up a bit mate Considering we were looking at a real chance of blanking this evening, it's a good recovery. And five minutes later, Roy makes it four. This side. This side, you've got it. You want it? Tired? You want it, yeah? Okay. Excellent. Well, that was a tricky little one. That kept us in, in sorry, in suspenders. That kept us in suspense for a long time. I've really got to, I've got to get out of that habit. But um, no, that was absolutely superb. We spotted that fox right out in the middle of this field um, and started squeaking. And it came in like a train, but it came in right across us. Um, and then we lost sight of it behind the sea wall here because we're actually sitting up on the top of the sea wall. So we've got um, the marsh here. Um, and then we're looking right out into the estuary out there. Um, and that was phenomenal. It just came bolting in, uh, but it came in um, a good 200 yards down and then came along the sea wall and then just crossed over um, just onto the, uh, the side that we could see it luckily um, and just came in there. So yeah, that's accounted for another one. So it's amazing. All of a sudden you just get into a little hot spot um, and, uh, and you start finding them. And again, you can find you can find litters, you can find um, earth so close together um, in environments like this, where there is just such a bounty of food. Um, and the, the old sea walls are absolutely perfect because they've been dug out by rabbits and whatever else. And then all the foxes have got to do is just come along um, and open up an earth for themselves. Um, and within a few hundred yards, you can have you know, potentially a, a couple of vixens having litters. Um, so you, you can get very, very high numbers out here. So you reckon same same litter? Yeah, I would have said that was probably the same litter. So she was just uh, further out in the field having a search around. The foxes played hard to get, and as the clock heads into the wee hours, we call it a night. We're going to call it quits now because it's. Uh, I think we leave it too much longer. It's uh, going to be getting light on us. David's feeling weary, and um, I think he, he needs a bit of a hug. He's, he's suffering now. He's a little bit cold. Had enough, want some heated seats and a cocoa. 
Uh, we're going to take him, we'll take him home, and tuck him up in bed. So it was uh, nice to get about a little group of three, um, and we had a, a tremendous response from number four as well. So yeah, I'm uh, more than happy with that, and gives us an excuse to come out again in a week or so. For more information about the Pulsar front-mounted night vision units, go to thomasjacks.com. And for more information about the Mauser M18, go to blazersporting.com. Can't go on for too much longer, we're running out of rounds. Thank you to Roy, Charlie and to James, our foxing trio. Now to a man who likes to be alone, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. <laughs> This is Field Sports Channel News. The blazing summer weather is starting to have an effect on wildlife. With parts of Scotland now in their seventh week without rain, deer have little fresh grass to eat and wildfires are devastating large tracts of moorland and forestry. Meanwhile, firefighters are struggling to control a number of major incidents. As well as the Saddleworth Moor fire, another has started at Winter Hill near Bolton and at sites across Wales and northern Scotland. There are fears the otterhound is dying out. Just 24 otterhound puppies were registered with the Kennel Club in 2017. There are 300 of them left in the UK and a total world population of around 1,000. Following declines in otters because of the use of pesticides in farming, the master of Otterhounds Association voluntarily stopped otter hunting in the 1970s. Otters were later protected by the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act. Otterhound numbers have been declining ever since. Wildlife has its own Facebook. Wildbook.org is designed to use artificial intelligence to convert whale watching and safari photos to track threatened animal species. This film shows how it's being used to count zebra in Kenya by treating each animal as a barcode. It can even trawl YouTube films. However, it risks a crackdown by Facebook, which doesn't like sites using the word book in their titles. Facebook forced the social network gunbook.com to change its name to shooters.network. Namibia and Zimbabwe are banning trophy photos on social media. This letter from the Namibia Environment and Tourism Department demands big game hunters do not post pictures of themselves with dead trophies on social media because it says the practice tarnishes the image of the industry. Wildlife populations in both countries are doing well thanks to hunting both countries are reacting to attacks by animal rights activists. And finally, it's not just the ball boys and ball girls and umpires and servers of strawberries putting in the hours at Wimbledon. This is Rufus the Hawk. The All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club employs Rufus to protect top tennis stars from pigeons. Hailed as Britain's best known bird after he was stolen and recovered in 2012, Rufus has accounts on Twitter and Facebook and his own Wimbledon security photo card pass with the job title of Bird Scarer. You are now up to date for Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, some information from Britain's largest shooting organisation. Thank you for watching that. Now we are entering a new era for game meat. Well, if we can make it look as good as this, absolutely. There's an art to preparing, presenting and cooking meat, especially game well, meat. Or... Today we will have plenty on which to feast our eyes. Let's start with the butcher and game dealer. Cheerio, have a nice weekend. Kai is catering for a wedding three miles down the road and has sourced some locally shot roe. Our game sales have only gone in one direction. And that's, and they, I mean, it doesn't go up in leaps and bounds, but it's a steady growth. 
John Murray and his staff know their onions, and as a result, so do their customers, who see the value in free-range, locally sourced wild meat. For, for, for £2.50, we're selling a pheasant, or four for a tenner. And you go to a supermarket, you can't buy a flipping broiler of chicken for a fiver, which will probably upset your tummy. Absolutely cheap meat. We also, with our um, pheasants and partridges, mainly pheasants, we stuff them. We, we, we bone them out and stuff them with game pate, but it's a meal for two or three for a fiver. There we go. Kai leaves with three whole row for the wedding guests at the Rumbold Farm venue in West Sussex. So what's he going to do with them? Create quite a spectacle you, is the answer. Cooking a fire is very uh, primal. It's a social thing. People, you know, drinking beer, having a chat, talking about whatever the sport, life. It's a celebratory event. Round of fire, our wedding, meat cooking. It's you just can't beat it. You definitely have a difference between these and fallow. Deer. It's going to take five hours to cook the roe. It would take seven for a fallow, so he needs to get cracking. We've got one of these uh, roe deer here from John Murray's. And what we're going to do is mount it on the cross. It's an Argentinian method. We, uh, we call it asado. Asado type cooking. And it's traditionally done with a lamb. But these guys have actually cut it for me. Usually I'd cut it myself. So I'd cut it down the pelvis um, all the way through. And they've actually butterflied and submitted it myself. So you're not cutting all the way through you're cutting just through the bone, so you, so you still have some meat on the other side, but it allows you to open up flat for flat cooking. So the fact that it, it goes flat like this, we'll put the cross on it, we'll mount it on with, um, with wires, and then it will be flat basically, so it's even side of cooking. Then after a certain amount of time, you'll turn it around and cook the other side. So I mean, one of these will do about 20 people, between 15 and 20 people, and then we've got another two of them as well. So. We'll have about 60 portions between the three roe deer. Is this commercially available, Kai, or do you have to order you, you made these? No, no, no. Uh, this is actually available from my mate Tom, Tom Bray, um, from Country Fire Kitchen. And he makes them. Uh, he lived in Argentina for a while. He now lives uh, near Salisbury. And uh, he has a, quite a good business, does, does all the kind of gear. Um, we do kind of similar stuff, really, but I specialise in game and I just buy it from him. So that's what we call the, uh, the cross. So you've got the point at the bottom there, which is going to uh, the holders, and we go shoulders down. So I kind of measure, I measure it up like that. So we wire it on, and then this will go shoulders down because the shoulders would require a lot longer cooking than the haunches. The haunches can be a little bit pink, but you try and chew on the shoulders and you'll be chewing for days. So we, we concentrate more of the cooking on the shoulders so they start to break up a bit more. And then we try and leave the haunches up top so they'll still be a little bit pink in the middle. It's hot work on a hot day, but everything is looking good and under control. If you put your hand there for 10 seconds, 10, between 10 and 12 seconds, it's kind of a, a low to good heat. And then if it starts getting like eight, five seconds, and the closer you get, the, the, the quicker you'll cook, like five seconds will be really quick. So uh, obviously take your glove off when you do it, otherwise you're not gonna feel the proper temperature, but we're gonna, rack the, we're gonna put them all out and then we'll uh, maneuver them where we want them. With the row in place, it's time to make the marinade glaze. We constantly baste the, uh, the deer to keep it moist, um, put some flavour into it. So I've got some red wine, which works quite well with venison. Um, got some olive oil here, I'm going to put some rosemary, some salt, some water in it. And then we just literally just flick that on with a paintbrush. So I'm using Malden sea salt, and you ask any chef, Malden sea salt is the salt to use. There's one tool that you need when you're brushing on your marinade on the road deer, and that's the uh, the trusty paintbrush. 75 mil, is that one you choose? Yeah, 75 mil, just washed it. Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> washed off the turpentine and some of the paint off it and then we'll slap that on the deer. But you're just gonna paint it on and just so that's, get that kind of the salty, oily kind of 
layer on there. You've got the wine that gives it the, the, the base and marinade flavour. And the more this cooks, the more the skin's going to bubble, colour, you know, kind of crispy and brown. It's going to be absolutely delicious. Delicious. It's, well, yeah. <laughs> delicious. <laughs> Every time a wedding couple books us, they um, pay a £500 deposit and then that entitles them to a, a tasting session in our woodland kitchen with four other couples. And then we put a little taster for them. So one of those is the pigeon breast. And before those tasters, a lot of the couples wouldn't go for pigeon breast because they've never had it before and they just think after they tasted it, it really has changed their mind and they absolutely love it. So the pigeon breast today with the mango salsa is, is a bit of a winner. As well as choosing venison, the wedding couple have also gone for wild boar and pigeon as part of the menu. Ones. This means that more than a hundred guests will be eating game today, maybe some for the first time. With only one chance to make a first impression, Kai is doing the game industry proud. The whole idea of weddings is to celebrate and get everyone together. And that's exactly what this type of cooking has always been about. So the food's on display for the guests when they come. Wow, look at that meat that's cooking. And that's kind of what people like to see. I mean, look, people come in now looking straight over. Oh yeah. <laughs> looking straight over at the fire. Um, catches their attention straight away. So like we said earlier on, that's that theater aspect. And more and more people want that for their weddings because it just adds to the day. It makes that day that little bit more special. For more information about yeah. Kai's business, Game and Flames, go to gameandflames.com. And if you want to buy some lovely venison, why not drop John Murray a line? JohnMurrayButcher.co.uk. Well done, Kai. And he does weddings, funerals, and even courses if you have a look at his website. Now, from asados to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. While the UK has been dry, New Zealand has been wet, and that characterises Crayfish and Nelly's winter seeker hunt on Backridge Butcher's channel. Staying in New Zealand, here's a GoPro film with a difference. Each shot is examined for the dog work, and occasional instructions and excuses posted as on-screen captions. Vukashin Prelevich sends me his latest. This time it is a roebuck on a butlo call. Ahmed Kalagasioglu is on the snowy high plains of central Anatolia to make this wild boar hunting film. Meanwhile, in France, it's a batu incroyable, incredible, says Alexis Chass, a Frenchman who's out with his Verney Caron Speedline rifle. American duck hunters are looking forward to the blue-winged teal season in September. Here is the Mojo crew out shooting over spinners. Hesham Khan takes a nice Punjab Uriel. This wild sheep is found all over Central Asia between the larger Argali sheep in the east and the Asiatic mouflon to the west. And finally, the night vision show is out with Partridge Attack. Kane is using the Pulsar Trail XP50 and Helion XQ50F handheld thermal while his brother Clint has the traditional wicked lights method mounted on a Mauser M12. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter. Best of all, you can pop your email address into our register page. And we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's out 7pm UK time every Wednesday. Plus, you can invest in us. Go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash shares. It only remains for me to say good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>